Here's a beautiful question that sits at the intersection of analysis and intuition. We have pi raised to the power of e and e raised to the power of pi. Which one is larger? At first glance, this might seem like we'd need to crunch some numbers, but there's actually an elegant path through this that reveals something deeper about the structure of mathematics itself. The direct approach of computing these values would miss the point entirely. Instead, we're going to use a technique that mathematicians love. When faced with something complicated, transform it into something simpler. So here's our comparison. That question mark is what we're after. It could be a less than, greater than, or even an equal sign, though that last one would be quite surprising. Now here's the key insight. The natural logarithm function has this wonderful property. It's strictly increasing. What this means is that if one number is bigger than another, taking the natural log of both preserves that relationship. And crucially, taking logs will bring those pesky exponents down where we can work with them. So let's apply the natural logarithm to both expressions. Beautiful. Now we can invoke one of the fundamental properties of logarithms. When you have the log of something raised to a power, you can bring that power out front as a coefficient. This is exactly what we need. So those exponents, e and pi, come down as coefficients, which makes this whole thing much more manageable. Now, there's something special about e. The natural logarithm of e is simply 1. That's actually part of how we define e in the first place. So that cleans up our right side quite nicely. Now, here's where things get interesting. If we divide both sides by e times pi, we'll put both sides into the same form, which will reveal a beautiful pattern underneath. And look what we get. The natural log of pi over pi on the left and 1 over e on the right. This is where the beauty emerges. Our original question has transformed into asking for the function that takes the natural log of x and divides by x, which gives a bigger value, plugging in pi or plugging in e. So let's call this function f of x. To understand its behavior, we're going to use calculus to find where it reaches its peak. Since we're dealing with a fraction, we'll need the quotient rule. The pattern is derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, all divided by the bottom squared. Working through the algebra, we get this lovely expression, 1 minus the natural log of x, all divided by x squared. Now, to find where this function might have a maximum or minimum, we set the derivative equal to zero. Setting this equal to zero. For a fraction to equal zero, its numerator must be zero. So we need the natural log of x to equal one. And the only number whose natural logarithm is one is e. So e is where our function has a critical point. But finding a critical point is just the beginning. We need to verify that it's actually a maximum, not a minimum or inflection point. Let's think about the sign of this derivative. The bottom part, x squared, is always positive for any positive x. So the sign of the derivative depends entirely on whether 1 minus the natural log of x is positive or negative. When x is less than e, the natural log of x is less than 1, so 1 minus that quantity is positive. A positive derivative means the function is climbing upward as we approach e from the left. But when x is greater than e, the natural log of x exceeds 1, making 1 minus that quantity negative. A negative derivative means the function is falling as we move past e to the right. So the function climbs up to e, then falls away afterward. 
This confirms that f of x reaches its absolute maximum precisely at x equals e. The algebra tells us the story, but let's see what this function actually looks like. Let's set up some axes to see this function in action. And there's our function. Just as the calculus predicted, it rises to a peak and then gently falls away. The mathematics checks out perfectly. The function reaches its peak exactly at x equals e, where the value is 1 over e. This is the highest point on our curve. Now, let's locate pi on our graph. Since pi is larger than e, it sits on the declining portion of the curve. And you can see it clearly. The function value at pi is definitely lower than the peak at e. Now we can piece together what this all means for our original question. Our analysis shows conclusively that the function value at pi is smaller than the maximum value at e. Now we just need to unwind all those algebraic transformations we made earlier. Multiplying both sides by e times pi. Now we use that logarithm property in reverse, moving those coefficients back up into the exponents, which gives us the natural log of pi to the e is less than the natural log of e to the pi. And since the natural logarithm preserves order, we can peel it away from both sides. And there's our answer. Pi to the power of e is indeed smaller than e to the power of pi. What I love about this solution is that we never had to compute a single decimal. Instead, we use the natural structure of mathematics itself to guide us to the answer. Thanks for taking this mathematical journey with me. If you enjoyed exploring how we can use the structure of functions to answer seemingly complex questions, consider giving this video a like and subscribing for more mathematical adventures.